Can I um can I share my screen yet, or do you want to do the thing first? Um, we have three honor speeches for you, Richard. So perhaps uh, let's yeah. Let's leave it like that for now. So uh, welcome to the Extra Wine series today with Richard Buhini. I'm so uh, happy to have him because Richard is um, one of the people who has helped build this community from the very beginning. So he's made so many important contributions and you will hear um, more about that. So because we honor you so much, you'll get these three honor speeches. So uh, Ira will say something, and then we have your first student, Napoleon, do the, um, the introduction. So it's on me now. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so um, Nicole had the... Um, idea to have Napoleon introduce you. And then she also wanted each of us, the three of us to say uh, words of appreciation for you because you're not uh, just any old uh, Expreg wine guest. You're you know, one of the originals uh, for, um, for our group. And I mean, I, I, you know, it's obvious that you have all the gifts that one needs uh, to do experimental pragmatics, you know, between, um, you know, your training and your interest in philosophy, linguistics, and then, you know, the, the latest uh, among your, uh, your skills is becoming a, an exper a experimenter. Um, but to be honest, for me, those aren't the, the things I think about when I think about what you brought um, to this now global project. Uh, for me, it's really about how it's the attitude that you brought um because one of the nice things that's been one of the things that's been nice working with you has always been that to see the project as being the most important thing so that means there have been times when uh you know it's important to take the front seat the other times there are times where it's it pays to take a back seat other times where to remove oneself from a project completely all for the sake of moving experimental pragmatics forward. And that's, that's um, you know, um, Richard's um, attitude in general. And, I, and, and it's always been appreciated. I just thought I'd mention two times. One, I think I might've mentioned this before, but one where, you know, you, you filled your role uh, to the T when it was most needed. And that was once when, when uh, you and I and a couple of other people had a, a project uh, for ERC that we almost, you know, it was one of the, I think the first synergy grant calls and we came awfully close. Um, and I remember when we were preparing it, you know, there were four of us on the project, but in the end it was basically you and me uh, putting it together. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that means, for, you know, for everybody on, online, you know that when you have to submit a grant proposal, you're working on it feverishly, not just for the last, you know, day, but for the last weeks. And so it was nice to have Richard as a, a partner in that. Um, another time was when, you know, you actually thought it would be best, uh, you know, the, I don't know if people know, but, you know, there's a trends paper that came out kind of early in the experimental pragmatics uh, history. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, my hope was that Richard would be co-author, but given that there was, um, you know, somebody, uh, you know, who was in, on the editorial team at, uh, at, at Tix that Richard was uh, close to. He didn't want to, want it to appear that there was any kind of conflict of interest. It was my wife. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to say it myself, but so, you know, and, and even though it would have been in his interest and been easy enough to, you know, be co-author on that, what became, you know, a, a nice paper for experimental pragmatics, you know, Richard said, ah, you know, it's probably best if I don't do this. And, um, you know, you don't see that too much uh, in, you know, where people's egos often come first. Um, but, you know, Richard has always been about the project first and then uh, our um, person or our egos second. Another thing I think about when I think about Richard is, is the kind of turns of phrase that stay with me. I, I don't know if other people have that experience with Richard, but like, I mean, the very first time I met him, I think it was in Deirdre's office. And he said something like, well, you know, maybe I'm not enough of a Griseologist 
to say whatever it was, you know, or to, to feel confident, confident about saying something. But it was that turn of phrase Christologist that stayed with me forever since then. And I've, I think I've used it myself since. And, you know, it's not the only time, you know, he'll, it might be Australianisms or Britishisms, but, uh, you know, he'll use words like joins instead of joint. And, you know, and so I, and even when he talked about xprag.it, he calls it xprag it, you know, it's like, <laughs> there is like, these very particular uh, turns of phrase that Richard has that, that make Richard stay with you even uh, when the meeting is over. Um, so those are the things I appreciate about Richard. Uh, and we're really glad that you're here tonight. I'll pass uh, the baton to Napoleon. Right, so yeah, uh, at, you know, at this point, I think everyone here knows Richard very well. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we know his work on scalar implicatures, on numerals, on negation, uh, questions under discussion, theory of mind, language acquisition and processing and many other topics. And, um, you know, it's, I would say, you know, universally acknowledged Richard has made massive contributions to theoretical and experimental semantics and pragmatics. And what's really striking is um, the deep understanding uh, Richard has of both formal linguistics uh, as well as the exceptional aptitude uh, as an experimenter. Uh, for those who don't know uh, his background so much, perhaps you know, we can trace some of these exceptional skills to his um, academic background. They're reflected in a, in a very interesting uh, academic progression. Richard started with a Bachelor's of Science at the University of New South Wales. And I think the specialization was actually maths. Um, and then he did another bachelor's, a BA now, uh, at Goldsmiths in London. And the subject was film and art. And I think it was somewhere in the semiotics and how science work um, part of the film and art curriculum uh, that Richard came across the work of uh, Deirdre Wilson uh, and Dan Sperber. Uh, and that's how uh, I would think film lost him, but pragmatics gained uh, somebody with the precision of a scientist and the sensitivities of an artist. Richard, uh, inspired by this interaction with some talks, I think some chats with Dan and Deirdre, he did his PhD at UCL. Um, and his very first academic appointment was at what was then the Research Center for English and Applied Linguistics at the University of Cambridge. And I had the absolute privilege to be among um, the first PhD students that he's had there in, in a group of fantastic people who were working on XPRAG uh, at the time, which included Paula Rubio Fernandez, Tavrula Custa, and others. Uh, Richard then moved back to London from Cambridge and he became the first professor uh, of experimental linguistics at UCL. Um, and, um, you know, there's many, many achievements uh, on, on his CV for which he would be very proud. Um, I want to relate one uh, where I've seen him be one of the proudest uh, moments of his life, uh, not as a theoretician of um, scalar implicature, uh, neither as an experimentalist of implicature, but as a father of implicature. I saw him once in his office beaming, like you know, with, with, with a smile from one ear to the other. And he told me, you never imagine what happened this weekend. Well, no, I, I can't imagine. Um, we went to the beach um, and Ned, and I told Ned, he said, Ned was his 23 month old son. And he says, I told Ned, ooh, you've been a good boy. Somebody's having an ice cream today. And Ned said, no, I am having an ice cream. And uh, I think Richard was like, yes, success in life uh, as a father of a 23 month old uh, with what I would say is at least a contrast implicature, if not a scalar implicature. So, um, uh, Richard, you know, you've been wonderful to, for the field and for, you know, for me personally and for, for many of us. And, you know, just a big thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. So, Richard, um, I just want to add, I'm so impressed at the you know, diversity of students that you've trained. Um, but that's, yeah, let's give you the floor now. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, I'm just going to hang on a sec. Uh, I have to do this little ritual. Um, here we are.
uh, share that and then this. Okay, now I'm, I'm looking at the right screen. Um, well, you know, I, I, I don't even know what to say. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Nicole and Ira and uh, Napoleon for those very kind words. And, you know, <clears throat> they're really not warranted, um, but uh, I'll, I'll take it. <clears throat> thank you. Um, okay, so I've only got uh, half an hour, so I better put a clock on or something. Right. Um, and uh, this is a paper that's come out of a project um, that uh, myself and uh, Paul Marti is the postdoc and Jacopo and Yasu Sudo and I have been working on for the last couple of years. And it's one of, um, uh, it's been actually a fun project, rather like we've been doing some theoretical stuff and some hardcore experimental stuff and some stuff in between. So it's, it's sort of, and this, this is a really more of a theoretical paper um, but hopefully you'll find it interesting and it's relatively short, so it'll fit into the time. So um, I also want to say that a couple of undergraduates, uh, finalists last year, helped out on the project, uh, Jack Farmer and Rebecca Wren. Okay, so they talked about um, disjunction and the implications that we uh, discuss in experimental pragmatics or pragmatics about disjunction. Um, and the role that uh, the pragmatic principles that we sort of talk about when we talk about pragmatics, uh, their role in uh, deriving these effects. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, a really interesting uh, challenge to the pragmatic account um, that was published by Danny Fox a few years ago, where he talks about a game show context. Um, and uh, he um, discusses these, uh, the example and he says, well, uh, you know, there's a, an inference here that the pragmatic account can't account for, uh, and that's why, you know, it, you know, more motivation for the alternative account of implicatures, which is the grammatical account. So the first order of business then, having uh, uh, introduced the, the challenge, as it were, from Fox from a few years back, uh, is to, uh, rather than rely on uh, introspection on the part of the theorists and a couple of referees of the paper, uh, let's do an experiment. So, in fact, an experiment was done um, um, uh, just before the one we did. And we did a sort of follow-up experiment controlling for certain, you know, potential confounds. Uh, and to, to give away the game a little bit at this stage, what we find in our experiment actually confirms the intuitions of Fox from that paper from 2014. So having um, sort of what well, confirmed, I mean, the evidence points in that direction, let's say. Uh, and then, um, so uh, when we got these results, and we, in fact, we replicated those results also uh, in a context, uh, in a design that involved pre presuppositional expressions, we, um, we um, uh, thought about, well, hang on a sec, uh, is, to what extent really is, the, is a pragmatic account really challenged by these results? So what we do is we went back to sort of the drawing board uh, and, and thought about ways in which we might uh, cast the pragmatic account more generally to see if we could derive the effects that are claimed not to be derivable. Um, and um, so we're going to tell you about the, what we think is a way to derive these effects um, that Danny Fox thinks that we can't derive. Uh, and then I'm going to talk at the end uh, about some questions that arise uh, about the data, about both explanations of the data uh, and uh, issues around sort of um, why the bias of participants to um, strengthen meaning when there's not a lot of evidential support for that. <clears throat> okay, so um, now I've got a weird scenario. Oh, I know what I've done. Hang on a sec, I'm just gonna move this there. Okay. Um, so uh, disjunction is, um, it gives rise to uh, two widely discussed kinds of inference. One is the so-called exclusivity inference. So if A says, what did John eat? And B says, he has an apple or banana, then you can often, people often infer that uh, B believes that John did not eat both an apple and a banana. And disjunction also typically gives rise to what's called ignorance inferences. So when B says he had an apple and a banana, you typically infer that B doesn't know which one he ate. Okay. Pragmatic accounts explain aspects, uh, certain aspects of meaning as arising from expectations speakers have of each other. 
Uh, and I'm going to, uh, in this talk, sort of uh, take as my lead the sort of um, a formulation of uh, a sort of principle uh, that I've taken from an earlier paper by Danny Fox. Um, and the spirit of this sort of formulation is that, you know, whatever your favorite pragmatic principles are, whether it's standard Grice or some other kinds of uh, theory or principles, they ought to entail something like this is the case. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and and well, at least people might, you know, would broadly agree that they entail that something like this is the case. So um, if uh, phi and psi are both relevant to the conversation and psi is more informative than phi and psi is among the alternatives to phi, then if a speaker believes both are true, the speaker should prefer psi to phi. Sort of like, I think, unobjectionable by, according to most people's favorite principles of pragmatics. Uh, and so, um, it, uh, Someone who we probably should mention in, in the in the in the context of early um, promoters of experimental pragmatics is uh, Uli, uh, and uh, as I mentioned in my talk about Ira at the workshop a few weeks ago, uh, Uli was you know there at the very beginning uh, you know working on Gracian uh, approaches to um, in implicatures, and um, you know, so let, let's take sort of what he says about the, the disjunction case. So that given something like MQ, which we, we just I just talked about, um, uh, the observation is that the, that if, if a speaker uttered a weaker st uh, statement phi when he could have produced the stronger statement psi, this means that the speaker does not believe that the strongest uh, statements holds. Okay, uh, and so if I get my little pointer working here. Um, <clears throat> And so we write this down as it's not true, the speaker believes uh, psi. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, I think Woolley called primary implicature after work by Scott Soames and also some discussion of that by uh, Larry as well. <clears throat> so we're, what are primary implicatures standardly thought about for disjunction? Well, here's our example again, uh, with the speaker utters uh, P or Q, and the alternatives are um, <clears throat> the individual disjuncts, John had an apple, John had a banana, and the conjunctive sentence, which is an alternative, John had an apple and a banana. Okay. And if these are the alternatives for the sentence, then the primary implicatures are um, that the speaker does not believe uh, the alternative. Okay. So he doesn't believe P, he doesn't believe Q, he doesn't believe P and Q. <clears throat> okay, so these Im ignorance implicatures I flagged up at the beginning uh, can be accounted for in that case. Uh, as, as following simply from the, the assumption that the speaker believes what they assert. So if he, if he asserted P or Q, he believes P or Q. And these two primary implicatures together imply it's not true the speaker believes not P and it's not true that the speaker believes not Q. Okay, so from the assertion and the two primary implicatures, it follows that the ignorance inference follows that the speaker doesn't know whether P or not P is true. Uh, and the speaker doesn't know whether Q or not Q is true. Okay. <clears throat> when it comes to this exclusivity of this exclusivity implicature um, that we discussed, this is a standard case, this is what you might call a scalar implicature. <clears throat> and in order to get to from these primary implicatures to the scalar implicature, Uli noticed that you have to make something what what I think he I think it was Uli that termed this the, the epistemic step. Okay. So here's our primary implicature. It's not true the speaker believes uh, apple or banana. Okay. And you have to make an assumption in order to get to the, the scalar implicature or the exclusivity inference in the case of uh, disjunction, uh, you have to make an assumption that the speaker has an opinion about uh, P or Q. That is to say, either the speaker believes P or P, sorry, P and Q. Either the speaker believes that P and Q is true or the speaker believes that P and Q is false. Okay. If you assume opinionatedness about, so the speaker has an opinion about P and Q, and you've got the primary implicature, then, then the, the, the main exclusive inference follows. <clears throat> okay, so now we turn to this uh, paper by Danny Fox from 2014. And he talks about uh, a kind of context that actually Grice uh, talks about in his um, uh, William James lectures, uh, where he discusses like a, a children's party um, and an adult says to the children, you know, we, I've hidden a prize uh, and it's in the attic or the basement. Okay. 
And then he discusses this as a case where the ignorance implicature or the ignorance inference gets cancelled. Okay. And it seems as though he's taking for granted where his maximum quantity uh, is suspended. Okay. Because the, the person, the adult, knows where the prize is hidden, if you see what I mean. Okay. And, and Fox agrees with this. He says that uh, in these kinds of game contexts, this MQ must be deactivated. And one argument for, uh, for uh, that is that um, uh, the observation that when MQ is active uh, and uh, there's a violation of ignorance, this leads to a kind of implicity. So I, I know where I was born, okay? And you know, it's common ground that I know where, where I was born. And I say to you, I was born in Sydney or London, and that's kind of infelicitous. <clears throat> So uh, 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 MQ uh, not being deactivated leads to um, uh, uh, infelicity if the speaker knows uh, which is the case. <clears throat> okay. So assuming that in these game contexts, MQ is deactivated, um, uh, the pragmatic account says that, uh, that we should expect no exclusivity because both the ignorance inferences and exclusivity follow from MQ. Okay. Um, and uh, Fox, Fox notes that, uh, by contrast, the grammatical account which he favours can derive exclusivity via link, this uh, insertion of a linguistic operator X. <clears throat> so this is the, the, uh, so the, the main sort of data point in this paper is based around this example that Fox uh, gives, and I've sort of cut and pasted into this slide. So <clears throat> there are a hundred, this is a, a TV game show where there's a host and there are contestants, let's say. Okay. So there are a hundred boxes and five of them contain a million dollars each and the rest of the boxes are empty. The show's host knows that the identity of the five boxes that have the money, but will of course not disclose information, that this information. Okay, so he's not going to tell you where the money is. Okay. Uh, at any point, contestants can, can take the risk of choosing a box. At various points, hints are provided by the host with a common understanding that these reveal only part of the relevant information available to the host. So the host says, there is money in box 20 or 25, okay? And Fox's uh, intuition is that, that there is not money in both. That is to say, uh, he's saying that there is <coughs> uh, um, an exclusivity in click check, uh, but of course there is no ignorance inference. It's the same kind of scenario as the Grice situation that we discussed before. And then he goes on to talk about, well, suppose that it turns out that there was money in both of them, then someone could justify this, say, what you said was wrong. You said there was money in box 20 or 25, but there was money in both boxes. Okay. He also notes that uh, if the host gives a different kind of clue, the exclusivity inference would be cancelled in, in, in ways you would entirely predict where you normally get cancellation. So the host could have said there is money in box uh, 20 or 25 or both. And this, this last part of the utterance uh, cancels exclusivity, okay? And there's no implication that uh, there is money, uh, not money in both. Okay, so that's the intuition from uh, the past master for Danny Fox and the reviewers of the paper that was published. Um, but uh, subsequent to that, there's more recently been an experiment to, to sort of, as it were, see if this is the intuition of normal language users. So there's a paper <clears throat> by Ekiman from uh, just a little while ago, which basically used Fox's scenario and tested uh, participants' uh, intuitions about uh, the case. Okay, so I'll just go over the design of this experiment in a little bit of detail because we basically copied this design in our own experiment. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a, a sample stimulus from the experiment. Uh, and uh, I'll read it out. Your task is to choose a numbered box. There are 100, 100 numbered boxes in total and five of them contain a million dollar prize. The host tells the first contestant that there is money in box. Now I should say this is, um, this is where we, we um, these are different conditions. The host tells the first contestant that there is money in box 20 or 25. This contestant picks box 20 and finds a million dollars there. Imagine you are the next contestant in the game. The host does not give you any new hints. Which action are you most likely to take? Choose box 25, choose another box. So in this, for this item, there's a, a, it's a two by two design. So they're manipulating whether the host says there's money in box 20 or 25 and nothing else, 
or whether the host says there's money in box 25, 20 or 25, or both. Okay, that's the, that's the implicature cancelling utterance. Okay. Uh, and the other thing they manipulate is that the, the, the contestant before you finds a million dollars or discovers the box they choose, box 20 is empty. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Okay. And what Agumon found is it's evidence for exclusivity. So I'll just walk through this, this graph. This is the, the blue line here. Sorry, the, um, on the x-axis, this is the results when the, the host says or both. That's the no condition. And the yes condition is where the host says just 20 or 25. Okay. And the blue line just sort of tells you that the people are being sane because this is the, the condition where the person before you chooses box 20 and doesn't get any money. Right. And everyone goes for box 25. They don't, they don't go for sort of box one or box three or anything like that. Okay. Okay. So that's the outcome when the person before you doesn't win. When the person before you does win, what they find is that uh, in the, as it were, the, the implicature condition, you do find uh, more people don't bother, don't go for the box 25, but go for some other box. Okay. More people than in the implicature cancelling case. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a significant effect. Okay, so when we were uh, working with these students, these undergraduates, we were talking about this, this uh, experiment, and we were saying how, well, you know, even in Grice's original uh, example, where you, the, the adult says the prize is in the attic or the basement, there is exclusivity there, but that's because, that's because as world knowledge tells you, it can't be in two places at once. If I say Ira is currently in Paris or Lyon, right? You can infer exclusivity, but you don't need to, as it were, to derive it as a conversational implicature. Just world knowledge will tell you that he's not in both places at once. And we were wondering, well, maybe in this game show context, something similar is happening. Okay. So here are some of the things that you might, that people might go through people's minds. So when the host gives a hint, like the the, the prize is in box twenty or twenty five, right? It lowers the odds if you choose one of those two boxes from one in 25 to one in two, okay? So any, any rational person would choose one of those two boxes and not some other box, okay? Um, another background assumption is that game shows do not normally just give money away, okay? That's, that's not how they work normally. And also game shows normally have some kind of jeopardy in terms of when the prize, you know, there is some like, you might win or you might lose, otherwise they're not very interesting things. So all these kinds of background assumptions might sort of lead people rather as in, in this IRA in Paris or London case to think, well, there can't be money in both boxes, just as it were, world knowledge tells me that I don't need to, need to make a kind of pragmatic inference. So what we did was we, uh, we tried to manipulate um, this, uh, whether, so we, we, we had two conditions, one which was a replication of Agumang's uh, uh, experiment. And the other one was a condition where, um, uh, we tried to, as it were, undermine these assumptions that might lead to exclusivity, regardless of there being, a, a, you know, some sort of pragmatic inference. Okay, so this is our item uh, for the replication, which is basically the same as the Agumang. And in the, um, um, I, I pinched this picture from something that uh, Nicole posted by in brackets. Um, <coughs> uh, we also we had another scenario where. Um, contestants are involved in a game show where if they pick the wrong, if they pick uh, the wrong box, they get slime. This, this slime goes on them and it's funny and it's uncomfortable and they, and they want to avoid that sort of thing. Okay. So your task is to choose the number, number box. There are hundred number boxes in total and five of them are associated with slime. The host warns the first celebrity, the one that comes before you, that slime is associated with box 20 or 25, the celebrity picks 20. And you know, we, again, we manipulate the conditions like they did in the other study. Okay. Imagine you're the next contestant. The host does not give any more information. Which do you choose? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the the game type, the money game and the slime game, is between groups. So we have two different groups of participants. Uh, we introduce, like Agumang, uh, two different kinds of uh, utterances. One involving disjunction, and, and one I won't go into details about involving one. So. Um, one box between, and then you give the two numbers, something like that. Okay. 
Uh, and we, we, we also vary sort of like whether there's 100 boxes and five prizes or six doors and two prizes and, and things like that. Okay, so they all had this, the logic of each kind of trial was the same. And again, we had these two, uh, two by two factors a design. Okay, the person uh, before you wins or loses, and you say the, the host says uh, all both, or um, they just say the disjunction. And these are the results. Uh, and um, let me just walk you through the results. On, on the upper row is the money game results, which basically is going to be a replication of uh, Agumang. And on the lower low, lower um, the row, we've got the slime results, OK? Um, in the disjunction case, regardless of whether the person says uh, or both or not, when the person before you uh, doesn't find an empty box with of no money, then everyone chooses the other box that was mentioned, which is what you would expect. Okay. In the slime case, uh, when the this is the I'm oh, sorry on the y-axis is the proportion of people who choose box 25 when box 20 was chosen by the person before. Okay. Uh, no one chooses chooses box 25 when the the uh, the celebrity before you chooses box 20 and nothing happens to them. Which is rational, right? So they're being they're being sensible, okay. Uh, but again, what we what we find is that um, in the um, oh sorry, I have to do this in the in the money case we replicate Agumon, so more uh, uh, um, fewer people choose box twenty five when the person before them uh, wins with box twenty, okay, uh, and a lot more people choose um, box twenty five when the person before them gets slimed. So basically it's the mirror image. It's, it's the same effect in the, in the money case and the slime case. Okay. So really we, we, didn't, we didn't budge, nothing, nothing budged, nothing changed at all in, in regardless of the scenario. Um, by the way, we, I just mentioned, I'm not gonna talk about this, that we did a presupposition version and we got exactly the same patterns of results with the money and the slime. So uh, our, um, our um, uh, thinking about this is, well, maybe, maybe we didn't do a good enough job of controlling for these contextual things. Maybe we could, do, could have done it better. But it looks like because it didn't really change at all between the two conditions, you know, it's not so, um, not so likely that uh, it was all down to just background knowledge, if you see what I mean. Okay. So it looks like exclusivity might be being derived by the participants in these contexts. Okay. This is where we go back to, uh, as it were, thinking about uh, what is the what is the oper operating uh, assumption that follows from whatever pragmatic principles that are in operation when when people talk to each other. Now, as I said, the sort of standard uh, the standard assumption in the literature and something that you know sort of uh, all you would have assumed in his two thousand and four paper is something like MQ. Okay, and this underlying part of MQ is where it says, then if a speaker believes both are true, they should choose the more informative one to the, um, to the less informative, okay? So the only thing we're gonna do in the rest of this talk is say, well, <clears throat> what if we sort of something, we say something more general, okay? If we say something ever so slightly more general, then we might, we might be able to derive exclusivity. And it goes something like this. Uh, if a speaker is, is in a position to communicate uh, both the more informative and the less informative, they should prefer the more informative. Okay. What does being in a position to communicate uh, bo boil down to? It means roughly something like they believe the more informative, right? Uh, and they would be willing to communicate or to add the more informative to the common ground uh, on the assumption they believe it. Okay. So they believe it and they and they would be willing to, to contribute it to the conversation. Okay. <clears throat> So primary implicatures uh, don't look that much different, but a little bit different in this more general system. So here's the assertion, here's the more informative alternative, and the primary implicature is that the speaker is not in a position to communicate the alternative. Okay. Note that this is weaker than the standard primary implicature because it's a negation of a conjunction. Okay. Okay, and when it comes to the epistemic step, we have a sort of slightly different epistemic step. 
and it goes as follows. So here's the assertion, here's the alternative, here's the primary implicature. Uh, and instead of having the speaker uh, is opinionated about uh, more informative alternative, we, we say that the speaker has an informative attitude about Psi. That's IA Psi, uh, which is equivalent to either the speaker is in a position to communicate Psi or the speaker is in a position to communicate not Psi. So remember the opinionation is either the speaker believes Psi or the speaker believes not Psi. So it's just the same except with this different attitude. <clears throat> now, in the normal case, in normal conversations, uh, both uh, the speaker is would be normally expected to be willing to communicate psi if they believe it true, and they'd be willing to communicate not psi if they believe it to be true. Okay, so these things are assumed, and given that that this this uh, epistemic step assumption boils down to opinionatedness about psi. Okay, and so in the normal context. We get to the the exclude the the scalar implicature that the speaker believes the the alternative is not true. Okay. And in this junction, we're just going to walk through this. It kind of works the same way, and we're going to talk also about the uh, ignorance implicatures. Okay. How am I going for time? I've only got seven minutes, five minutes, a bit more. Six, seven, okay. Yeah, I mean, we started later, right? Um, but yeah, maybe five minutes. We so started at 27. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, uh, assertion is the disjunction. These are this, the standard uh, alternatives and these are now our primary implicatures, okay? In normal context, the speaker is willing to communicate P if they believe it and, and Q, okay? And if you sort of follow through this, you get the, the standard primary implicatures, okay? And from these standard and primary implicatures, as I mentioned before, and the assertion, the ignorance inferences follow. That's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> exclusive implicatures follow in the normal way, assuming that, this, that we can assume uh, W of P and Q and W of not P and Q, okay? Uh, using this epistemic step, okay, we get the, the exclusive inference. Okay, so what's what's going on in the game show and what's changed? What assumptions are, are affected in the game show context is the question. So even though the host knows in which boxes there is money, uh, that person cannot give away the exact location of any money box. So we cannot assume that W of P, W of Q, or W of P and Q, like we did in the normal context, okay? However, she, of course, she can give away hints which help the participant as long as she doesn't give away the exact location of money. That's the assumption that Danny Fox sets out in his paper. And that's we're assuming the participants in our experiment uh, use that assumption. Okay. So if this is the case, we get no ignorance implicatures in game shows. Okay. So our assertion, alternatives, and primaries are all the same. We cannot assume W of P or W of Q. Okay. Thus, our primary implicatures do not imply the negation of belief P and the negation of belief Q. Okay, so there and and so we can't derive the ignorance implicatures. Remember, the ignorance implicatures are derived from these as primary implicatures and the assertion, but we haven't got those, so we haven't got ignorance implicatures. Okay, so ignorance is felicitously blocked, even though the speaker knows what is the case, okay. and that's different to the standard context. Okay, uh, but exclusivity is not blocked in these game shows. Okay, so we have our uh, stand uh, the primary implicatures as before. The rules of the game preclude us from assuming W of P and Q. Okay, but they don't uh, preclude us from assuming W of not P and Q. In fact, w not P and Q is a disjunction. Okay. <clears throat> Thus, uh, that the inform that the speaker has an informative attitude about P and Q is still an assumption you can make. Okay. Uh, and given the primary implicature and that the assumption that the speaker is willing to communicate not P and Q, you derive the exclusivity uh, implication. Okay. Uh, and that's it. Okay. Um, what we learned from our experiments. This is one little uh, one little point. If you give me just two minutes to get to it, I'll get to it. Um, many participants are prepared to infer exclusivity, not all, by any means, 
but there are obviously that there are people who are in, are inferring exclusivity in our in our game show in the game show, uh, and this confirms our interpretation of the rules. That is to say, um, something like uh, uh, yeah, the, this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But now, so there's a question, and this is where it sort of gets a bit interesting. Um, so let me just go through this. Uh, but it's interesting that participants feel justified in making these critical assumptions that the speaker would have uh, an informative attitude about P and Q, okay? Uh, and they're willing to communicate uh, not P and Q, okay? The rules and the context make uh, this a possibility, but will we normally assume this if we think that the speaker is not willing to communicate P and Q. Okay. <clears throat> uh, for example, one thing that's kind of odd is that participants seem to discount the possibility that the host thinks that there is money in both. In, in other words, why, why, why not assume the speaker believes P and Q, but of course they're not willing to communicate P and Q because that violates the rules of the game. So that would give away the location of money. Okay. Even in the slime scenario. Okay. So why, do, why, why make this set of assumptions, right, rather than this one, okay, is the interesting question, okay. Um, and the answer to that question, I have to say, I might just skip to the last slide first. I have to say that the same problem arises for the grammatical account, okay. So for the grammatical account, there are two possible passes for the host uh, sentence, uh, the one with X and the one with no X, okay. If you update, update the common ground with this pass, okay, um, you would have to take for granted the speaker believes not P and Q, uh, and they're willing to communicate not P and Q. So the same kinds of assumptions that, that the participants, according to the pragmatic derivation, are making need to be made also for the uh, grammatical account. So whatever account you're talking about, it's kind of odd that this is going on in this game so scenario. Okay. So one thing we thought about was. Um, was uh, something along the lines of the strongest meaning hypothesis, okay? But at a bit more sophisticated. Again, it's sort of at a more general level, okay? So um, we're saying there's there's a bias to optimize a conversational update. If you have to make a diff if, if different sets of assumptions about the update lead to different uh, strengths of update, right? Other things being equal, you will make the assumptions that lead to the stronger update. Okay. This is what this says here. So the hearer is biased to resolve uncertainties about the intended update in ways which optimize the relevant informativity. Okay. <clears throat> and the speaker is aware of this bias and should phrase their utterance to avoid any unwanted implications. Okay. Uh, so at making these assumptions about the game show, about the context that the the speaker has an informative attitude about uh, P and Q, and they're willing to communicate uh, not P and Q, leads to a more informative update than assuming, say, the speaker believes P, uh, P and Q and is unwilling to communicate P and Q. <clears throat> uh, and as I said, this is sort of maybe this more, this more, um, uh, the statement about maybe a bias in the way hearers uh, make resolve uncertainty in a in an utterance context uh, is we're thinking is probably the same thing that goes on um, 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 in these cases like with plural definites and reciprocals for which uh, people uh, have posited the strongest meaning hypothesis and that really is my last uh, thing to say because George has come to say is that George no. Michael. Michael, sorry, Angel. Uh, so, uh, um, so Michael's come to say that's enough, so I'm going to stop. Thank you so much, Richard. So let's thank our speaker. And uh, as always, you can post your questions in the chat. So please, like, uh, ideally, uh, write out the whole question. And if you're a junior researcher, put something like J, and then we'll prioritize your question. Can I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah.
that we can see everyone. Maybe be, while we're waiting for questions, so were there any differences between the numerals and the disjunction condition? Um, no. Okay. No, there was there was it was perfectly the same. I think it was ever so slightly less robust the numeral, but um, it, I don't think there was an effect there. <clears throat> Chris, please ask your question. Uh, yeah, shall I shall I speak as well? I'll just uh, yeah. Read it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I wondered whether there was this asymmetry. I thought it's a really interesting idea to look at these these sort of sort of semi cooperative cases, um, and I wondered whether there was an asymmetry between the two scenarios because um, I mean I agree with your intuition that the in the you want to win the money scenario may be the best that the the show the format is willing to give the contestant is a 50-50 shot at the prize, um, in which case you don't want to go any further than it, there's a prize in box 20 or 25, or maybe both. Um, but in the case where you're trying to avoid the slime, would it not be the case that being told it's in box 20 or 25 amounts to saying, avoid both these, and you'll improve your chances yeah. by picking yeah. randomly among the other boxes? So I wonder if there's any evidence of, of people kind of thinking at that level of um, scenario construction in the way they responded. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And that um, it, it's not entirely parallel because why would you choose one of those two boxes when they got slime in? And this is why we called, we, 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 had, we had them be celebrities. So it's like, um, you know, it's something you want to avoid, but someone's for the fun of it, or, you know, in the spirit of, interesting TV is choosing one of the two boxes. But yeah, that's, that, I think that's, um, um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, that's, I think that was just something about the thing, but the participant then has the choice to do what they want. So, so are you saying then that you think that uh, the participant would, would, would be thinking, oh, um, what I mean, I'm I'm wondering whether they would just think you know that was a clue to say avoid those boxes. You know, will boost your chances of avoiding yeah. the slime by telling you here's right. one one of them is right. in one of these but, boxes. Okay, but so but then so then when the when the celebrity gets slimed, okay, you know before them by choosing box twenty, um, lots of people choose box twenty five, thinking that that's a good choice because they're off scot free. You see what I mean? That there's not going to be slime in there, so mm -hmm. um, so that that and and really the same rate as in the money case. It's really quite um, sort of very similar rates. It makes sense, yeah. So um, yeah, so so getting the getting the, the the participant into the situation in the slime case, the same as the money, involved this slightly weird thing where a celebrity is choosing, like doing something dumb. <laughs> by well, I think you, I mean you, I wasn't sure whether that was the scenario we were describing because it's something you could make it less done by saying the celebrity doesn't have this information. But you're playing after well, them, and you're uh, told. Well, that. we didn't do that. We just we, okay. we we wanted it was parallel to the previous game. So oh. um, yeah, <clears throat> I got to change. Hang on a sec. Um, Uli, next question. Hi, Richard. Hi, Thanks. It was, was fun the talk. I was wondering whether you thought about a different way of sort of you you raised this po point that the game show host is not just around to kind of make the game completely boring by sort of picking out two boxes that both contain money, but um, you can could also test the case where the game show host says, "Well, there's money." behind one of three boxes, so 20, 25, uh, 30. Um, and then contestant one finds money behind 20. Um, 
and then sort of could there still be money behind 25 or 30 um, these two boxes? I mean, whether that would violate kind of this, I mean, that would violate the exclusivity inference that it's only behind one of the three, but it wouldn't violate this rule that you made um, for the game show host that is just not allowed to make it completely uh, give you a hundred percent chance of getting the money or something. Um, so, so is the is the utterance the game show host says there's money in box twenty or, or twenty five or thirty. So you have three disjuncts. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, three and, disjuncts, and then go on. And then, but then, how? And what? Are we, so, what are, are you thinking that if the? Oh, I see. And the two contestants before choose and get money from the um, from the first two boxes. Is that right? Oh, sorry. Get get. Uh, no, get. No, I was sort of more thinking in the original kind of the, the, the sort of intuition that Fox reports that so. It's, there's money behind 20 and then later we find out that there is also money behind 20 behind box 25 could then a contestant complain that the game show host kind of right i see right 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 was was kind right. of right, kind right. of lying in in with his utterance and this doesn't directly work with the way you tested this, I think. So this no, no, I get the point. But, you, but the main question is about uh, what does the general account say about the three disjuncts case? Is that right? Yeah, so it seems to me that that should be a case where your account and Fox's account make different predictions. I mean, as I understand, Fox's account would predict that if it's behind box 20, then the other two have to be empty. And as I understand your account, it would predict that it would allow money behind 20 and 25, or 20 and 30 or something. Yeah. That was a question whether that's a correct yeah, yeah, no, I haven't thought about this disjunct case. Uh, but it, just in general, the, the the A or B or C case, not in game show scenarios. I mean, you can derive the single exclusivity with a uh, pragmatic account, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, yeah um, you can. Yes. Yes. Um, and so I'm not sure whether you can't with our account in the game show scenario, if you see what I mean. So I'm not sure that we make different predictions at this point. Jacopo. Nobody, yeah, okay. Sorry. No, sorry, can I just jump? What's the question though? When you said only our account, you meant just relying on the rule of the games? Because that, that I can see that would make different prediction with the three disc jump, right? So in fact, seems quite ingenious, right? Because Two of them out of three would still allow the rule to be to be compatible with the rule of not giving away completely, right? But not exclusivity. But that's not our account. That's the potential confound, right? Is that mm -hmm. what you were saying? Okay. So the the account as Richard spelled it out at the end makes a different prediction from this. Yeah. Because this rule also still played a role there that the game show host is not allowed to give away the making makes it sort of gives the contestants a, make it just boring and give, uh, leave no suspense or whatever um, in the in right. the show. Um, yeah, sorry, should leave it to Richard to to, to respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so so um, okay, so so I, I need to think about that. I mean, I, but I, I can see what you're getting at. So you're saying that 
given the rules of the game and the way we use the rules to derive exclusivity, if there were three disjuncts, uh, we may not derive single exclusivity. That, that's the claim. I have to think about that. I don't know if Jacopo, if you've got a, a response to that. No, I think we need, we need to think about that, yeah. That's a, that's a nice point. Thank you. Have you tried to apply your account to other cases or thought of other cases where you might have diverging predictions? Yeah, so uh, we were talking about this this afternoon. Um, most most contexts, the, um, the, the, the general case collapses to the, what you call the standard case because of, of these um, assumptions about willingness uh, so, yeah, so we need to think about other cases where um, um, but I mean, I, basically the game shows are those <laughs> other cases, if you see what I mean, this is, this is, um, I don't think, I'm not sure if there are any others, or with other expressions, perhaps, um, um, uh, well, we use the one case and that would work, that kind of works the same. Um, other questions? So I don't see more questions in the chat. Ah, oh, there is um, a hand. So Cassie, yeah. Not to continue on the same um, triple disjunction thread if people don't want to, but I was wondering if anyone has um, intuition that adding more disjunctions in a chain changes the interpretation regarding like how likely we are to interpret it as exclusive or inclusive. Because for me, at least, my immediate thought was once somebody has chained a third disjunction on, my exclusive interpretation jumps up in likelihood. So you said, Richard, you controlled for also like the number of things, right? So the number of boxes and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, control is, we had some Bad. small number cases and some these large number cases with a hundred, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure about the triple, if it's stronger, this is Cassie's question, I mean, I think it's about the same. It's not. It's not weaker. I don't think. I don't know what other people think. Is that Daphna has a question? Yeah, Daphna has a question. Yeah, let's take this one. I think we need to do the experiment. <laughs> so I kind of want to like take a big step back and like. I want to understand what components of meaning. So I'm trying to understand what is the um, bigger picture difference between the grammatical account and the pragmatic account that leads to different predictions. Like, what are the meaning pieces that you have? What, what are you saying about how language is interpreted when you make the step from belief to evidence plus willing to communicate like that's what i want and it's it's really clarification because i i think that the relationship here between the details and the bigger picture is really really hard so can you can you help me uh, uh, <laughs> you mean between the grammatical account and either pragmatic account or, or or between the standard pragmatic and the, the one that we yeah yeah probably maybe I actually maybe I'm thinking between the grammatical and the one that you're proposing I think that that's where I got that's that's where my question comes from but like you can choose so I'm kind of trying to understand how uh, postulating different aspects to meaning there namely what the speaker knows which is different from 
um, what the speaker wants to communicate, which is different, you know, right? Like when you postulate those different meanings, how does having those different aspects of the communicative situation give rise to the different predict? How does this tie to the different predictions? Well, I, I, as I was saying that uh, if you um, if you have if you think about the sort of MQ in terms of this person being in a in a position to communicate, then there are there are, there are and if they if they use the weaker uh, you know alternative, then there are, there are two ways in which they may not be they may two kinds of reasons why they don't use the stronger alternative that, that that's that's all that's the difference between the standard case which only has one which is about belief and the more general what we call it the more general case which where you know other things are involved and so this this normally doesn't make a difference but it does in the game show because you you can make assumptions about their their not being willing to give away where the money is but that they're being willing to give information away that is a hint, but doesn't give exact location of the money. So that that was that was the sort of the insight, if you see what I mean. The grammatical account just says there's another part of the sentence which has a covert operator that's like only, and it just means only. So you can pass a sentence both ways. And if you choose to pass it uh, with only then uh, it means 20 or 25, but not both. <clears throat> that's, that's, there isn't really much to say about. But, it, but I, I thought what I was saying at the end was that it's interesting that even if you um, like the grammatical account, that people are going for this pause of the sentence, um, uh, presumably making these assumptions, implicitly making these assumptions about um, what the speaker is willing to communicate and what they believe, which are the same as what the other account does. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess my, now, now I understand my question better and I'm going to have to think about this more, but I think the, my, my question is about what um, parts is uh, the pragmatic, the prag I see the grammatical account as having like a default meaning and a non-default meaning. I don't know if people will agree with that. Um, and the pragmatic account as having different meanings that work against different knowledge states of, um, for, you know, of interlocutors or different, uh, some, something yeah. like that, yeah. different background information. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is a different issue from what are the meaning components, namely, do you, is it beliefs or do we have this extra layer, which I completely agree with you that there is uh, about uh, what is the speaker choosing to communicate in this situation? I guess that's kind of like was my question, but thank you, that was really helpful. Okay, so let's thank Richard again. Oh no, there's another question. Okay, we can take another short question. Yeah, sorry, it shouldn't take long. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what kind of instructions people were given, um, especially in respect to their probability to get the money price overall, their overall probability. So if they pick another box, because I'm thinking if we're, we're giving them information about two boxes, they might not completely disregard the idea that both of them had the price in them, but they might think it's still more likely that they will get it if they pick something outside of the information they've received. Do you understand where I'm going from? No, I, was the question, I, I thought at the beginning that the question was about what was the instruction we gave to the participants? Yeah, yeah, more like the information that they had about the functioning of the game, like what's the probability of getting the prize? Uh, is it in only one? Well, in only like a few boxes. Right, right. So yeah, so it's the same as in the in that uh, the quote from Danny Fox that there are a hundred boxes, five of them have a million dollars, okay. and none of the others do. We did vary. Okay. We said like there are six doors, and two of them have whatever the prize is behind the door, um, uh, and things but variations on that. But there's there's a you know polarity of 
options and then only a smaller subset have the prize behind it or the slime in the case of the slime is that is that what your question was about yeah yeah exactly yeah because uh, yeah i'm just i mean i feel like if i was doing that game i would probably have a very like probabilistic approach to it and think that if i have information about two boxes i will not completely disregard the idea that it might be in the second one but just think it's more likely if i pick in the in the bigger pool but yeah thanks for yeah the i think that was that was kind of what we were saying might be you people might act as if they've derived exclusivity but on the basis of sort of some background reasoning mm -hmm. if you see yeah that. Yeah, um, yeah, and not sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, as I say, our alternative uh, experiment may not have completely defeated those background assumptions, um, and th that's something that you can look at. I think you know, I was, I was not one hundred percent convinced that we eliminate the jeopardy, for example. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, that we eliminate the assumption that there should be jeopardy, that you can win or lose, if you see what I mean. Um, but you know, <clears throat> yeah, great. So you, you could go back and do and do a, a better design where you try to control more tightly for those things. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank Richard again uh, for the exciting talk. Um, quick announcement. So um, the next speaker is another odd all star so Valentina Bambini who's there with the child and Walter and um, so we're really looking forward to your talk Valentina uh, I also highly recommend that you watch um, Richard's talk at the Expert Italy wine event which is online now because it's a really great overview of the history of Expert and um, also if you don't know yet Richard and I are doing the Palgrave series now um, together so if you want to give us a book, let us know. Um, and thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you next month. So bye bye.